Okay, welcome to today's lecture. We're kind of finishing up a topic on scheduling algorithms and mechanisms, and we want to take just a minute to talk about real-time systems. Now, when we talk about real-time systems, there's some unique aspects uh, that we have to deal with that we didn't deal with in just the multi-user, multi-processing systems that we talked about. Of course, in real-time, uh, performance is much more of an issue uh, because we have to be concerned with the fact that in most cases in a real-time operating system, the end result is that we have processes that need to interact with the real world and with sensors, uh, actuators, etc., etc., uh, even monitors that have to react with a very uh, precise uh, timing so that uh, we can create a part, we can place a part in the right place in a manufacturing environment, or um, we can turn on and off valves in a, a refinery or in a chemical processing plant, or even on your swimming pool at home. Um, all these things have to be done uh, at the right time to achieve the, the result of whatever computation is being done and whatever process is being controlled. So one of the, the things we had to be concerned about is how to make sure that all these processes, if there's multiple processes, and usually in a real-time system there's a limited number of processes, or maybe more than one, but there's a limited number, and typically we don't have a lot of user interactive processes. Um, we may have some that do reporting to status screens or something like that, or to a small device like the thermostat at your house, but not a lot of user interactive stuff because that those are the things that tend to be non-predictable and also that can uh, consume a lot of CPU time. So um, we're looking at things often that happen on a recurring basis. So this first uh, sort of scheduling methodology for real-time systems, a lot of real-time systems, um, the processes are periodic. Think about monitoring, for example, in a, in a manufacturing or refinery type environment. We're monitoring various sensors. We want to monitor them every X number of seconds or milliseconds uh, to make sure that things are operating properly. Um, and we have a bunch of those, and they happen. All of them happen periodically, not exactly at the same time, obviously, uh, but they all happen on a particular frequency. So um, we may have kind of a round robin kind of thing uh, if you think about it, not from a scheduling perspective, in terms of uh, sensors. Sometimes we call that polling. So we may be polling different sensors, and then doing computations in between to make sure we don't need to make any adjustments. Um, so if we look at processes as being periodic, they repeat at fixed intervals as mentioned here. Um, if we have a period D, so it's activated every D units of time, and it has to be do the computation that time, then we can develop a scheduling algorithm based on that. Um, our PF function is P equal negative D, that's our priority function, where D is the fixed period of time that process needs to use the CPU. It's preemptive, um, so a, a more important process could, <laughs> oh, excuse me, could interrupt this. Um, and then we have a random or chronological AR. So if we look at the rate monotonic, sort of when things happen, um, it's an optimal static priority scheduling algorithm. In other words, we know sort of up front what the uh, priorities are going to be, and they, they don't change. In other words, everything happens at the same period every time. It doesn't suddenly become random, for example. Um, the priority is based on the period, which we talked about on the previous slide. So tasks with a shorter period have a higher priority. If you think about that, that makes sense. If I got one thing that's going to be monitored every five milliseconds, and another thing that's going to be monitored every 15 milliseconds, uh, the five millisecond one is going to have a priority. In fact, during the 15 millisecond one, it needs to happen two to three times. Um, so we execute jobs then with the shortest period uh, is what the end result is, even though we're doing it based on priority. And we just assign the priority to match the period. So. Um, a particular process graph might look something like the one shown here. 
uh, with periods and then the priority assigned and then the um, arrival. So here we have one with a, with a period of four units, whatever our units are, milliseconds maybe, a one with five and one with seven. And so we see the, the one with four has the highest priority and then five and then seven. Uh, but we do get interrupted to handle the other ones. <coughs> So it executes the job with the shortest period at any given at any given time, and this shows how the how they would occur, realizing that they may be interrupted. And so one of the issues we sometimes have is we may miss uh, a deadline, and this shows where that where that happens. So one of the uh, sort of statistics, if you will, or one of the measures on a real-time system is something called schedulability. Uh, it's a property of a real-time system, real-time operating system, uh, or even just a set of real-time tasks, indicating whether or not they can meet their deadline. So you can think of it as kind of a yes or no, true, false kind of thing. Um, the task, which is a sequence of similar jobs, each task may have a period um, it's, if it's a periodic task, repeats. In this case, the, the period P is the uh, release time of those when I don't need the processor. The execution time is the maximum execution time, which has to be um, between zero and whatever the period is. And utilization, or percentage basically, of how much of the period that I actually have to execute and it takes me to get the work done. So if the period is every 10 milliseconds and it takes me 5 milliseconds to do the actual work, then my utilization percentage would be 50%. In other words, I'm using half of that inner process time. And here we get into some of the scary looking math, but it's really not that scary, it's just a summation. It says the real-time system is schedulable under um, the rate monotonic system if the sum of all the values from the previous slide, the schedulability or the utilization, if the sum of all the utilizations is less than or equal to n times 2 to the 1 over n minus 1. And this comes from a journal of ACM paper on scheduling in a multi programming hard real-time environment. In other words, hard real-time environment means our deadlines are, are hard. If we miss a deadline, we have a problem. We're going to have something go flying off the assembly line or have a car without a steering wheel or something like that. <clears throat> so in our example that we had previously, if we look at the T1, T2, T3, we know that the utilization for the first one is 1 over 4, 1 over 5, and then 1 over 10. The 1 being the second value in the tuple indicating that, for example, if these were milliseconds out of a four millisecond uh, period, we need one millisecond to do the actual work. So we're using one fourth of the of the cycle, if you will. And if we add all those up, then we get 0.55. Um, and the value in this case, n being three, because we have three processes, three times two to the one third minus one is about 0.78. Uh, since our utilization is underneath that, it is schedulable under rate monotonic system. So math wasn't really as scary as it looked. Uh, it just had some powers and stuff in there. So the blue formula implemented there in a very simple example. Now obviously it gets a little more tedious to compute if we uh, have more processes, but we can continue to compute that until we reach such a point that it may not be schedulable. So the point of this is we have a way to determine if given a particular set of processes we can actually schedule it in such a way that uh, they can all accomplish their tasks. Um, so it could be that while uh, rate monotonic is schedulable, is, has, is possible to be schedulable, that a particular set of processes may not be schedulable under that uh, particular technique or that particular scheduling uh, approach. 
So we have to determine this for each set of processes. And it may change over time. In other words, we may have a set that is, and then we may add additional processes, and suddenly it becomes not scheduled anymore. If you just look at the, the raw numbers, we've got a little bit of space between the 0.55 and the 0.78, um, but not a whole lot. So you know, we couldn't add a whole lot of processes, especially ones that have um, used, used time, if you will, in the cycle that uh, uses up more of the cycle than just you know, one out of X units, uh, which is what all these particular ones happen to do. So we don't have a lot of space left. In fact, if we had another one that had a one over four, we'd pretty much be uh, out of the ballpark. Yeah, it would be 0.7, yeah, point, yeah, let's see, one fourth, 0.25, we'd be adding 0.55, 0 0.6, we'd be at 0 0.8, so, and then we would no longer be schedulable. So, it doesn't take much to get us out of the ballpark pretty quickly. And then here's a graph of what that looks like if we look at the number of tasks. Um, and the utilization uh, and then so this is just the utilization numbers and we can see that it, that the tasks get larger the utilization kind of converges on a particular number Now here's another approach to dealing with real-time system scheduling called earliest deadline first. The idea here is, uh, you think of this as sort of the uh, last minute kinds of things, like probably some of you, this is probably the algorithm some of you use to get your homework done for all your different classes. In other words, which one's due today, I'll do it first, and which one's due tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we don't usually use these, any of these techniques that we're talking about today in non-real-time systems, in other words, uh, just our normal user operating systems, things like that. We use these when we're dealing with you know, critical task kinds of things in real-time systems where there's deadlines. Now, many of you have real-time oriented kinds of operating systems that you use, certainly things in your car, um, in many cases the uh, operating system in your cell phone, uh, and other kinds of devices like that are real-time type operating systems. They're scaled down, they don't have a lot of frills, they don't have all the uh, utilities that you have available to you when you hit the command line in Linux, et cetera, et cetera, because they don't need all that. They have for a very special purpose, and uh, so they only need a certain subset of, of all the things that we can do. So on this one, the highest priority is assigned a process with the smallest remaining time. Um, so the deadline's approaching quickly, I need to get that task done first. Um, so these are also, this is the kind of schedule I can use to places like McDonald's and the drive through okay? So the earliest deadline is the car that's next in line, which you can also look at as a queue. But we don't have that much remaining time before we hit whatever our magic number is that's our goal um, for process time in the drive through if you will. Um, we assume the process is periodic, uh, and in most real-time systems, most processes are, because we're monitoring sensors, or we're doing some kind of repetitive task, like in a manufacturing environment, et cetera, et cetera. So um, no different than, for example, your cell phone's constantly pinging the tower to make sure it has signal, and adjusting the, the quality of the signal, and the strength of the signal, and things like that. So these are the kinds of things we're talking about. <coughs> and we also assume that the deadline is equal to the end of the current period. So if we know the, the periodicity of, of a particular task, then we know based on where we're at in the timeline how much time we have left before the deadline is when it has to be done before we start another cycle, if you will. So in this case, our, our PF function, uh, priority function is... Again, a negative number, remember we're always using negative numbers um, for probabilities, and it's D, where, where D is our period, minus R divided by D, or not divided by, but modulo D, where R is the time since the process first entered the system, and D is its period. Right? So we can compute that number, that becomes our priority, 
So R over D being basically the R divided by D is the number of completed periods. R modulo D is an already expired fraction of the current period. So we know how much of the period is left, basically, given that. Okay. Uh, it's preemptive and it's dynamic. In other words, priorities change. You know, the longer you've been in the system, <coughs> and the farther along we are in your particular period, the different the priority is going to become a smaller negative number, which means it's going to be a higher priority. Um, and our arbitration function is random or chronological, so we can either do it randomly uh, if there's ones at the same time, or uh, based on which one's been here the longest. In other words, a seniority uh, type principle, which is what chronological is indicating. So in this one, if we had three processes, um, kind of similar to the ones we had before, but notice their uh, uh, amount of time it takes to do the work while they're in their, their period is a little bit different. So um, it's still optimal dynamic priority scheduling system. Task with a shorter deadline has a higher priority. So we execute the job at the earliest deadline. So here's our three processes, a 4-1, a 5-2, a 7-2. <clears throat> Notice that the little tan boxes indicate basically when I'm done for those ones with longer period. So if we looked at scheduling these tasks, uh, then our picture would look something like this. So every fourth, every fourth one we would uh, execute the T1, and then the T2, and then the T3. And the arrows indicate when we're when we're needing to be able to schedule that one until we're making sure that there's no overlap that we can accomplish accomplish that as early as possible. Okay. So this just shows it extending out for additional processes, additional occurrences. So basically, if there's a schedule for a set of real-time tasks, uh, earliest deadline first can, can schedule it. So it wouldn't be the exact same uh, issue as we had with the uh, previous one. Utilization bound in this, time, in this particular case is the sum, uh, the sum of the utilizations has to be less than or equal to 1. Okay. So as long as it's less than or equal to 1, then we can schedule it. And again, this comes from that same journal of ACM. Uh, article. Now we can get into an overload condition if the sum is, is greater than one. Um, so we can have cases where we would miss our deadlines uh, doing that. So there may be some alternative scheduling, especially when they're all equal but larger than one that we can accomplish. And so here's an example. So this might be a good test question if, for example, uh, what would cause an overload in the EDS system given, say, like three processes? Could you add a fourth process that would cause an overload condition? Be sure and uh, also read in your book the section that contains this information. If you look in the syllabus, it's going to give you the reading assignments because uh, that will help give you a better view. And I'm going to add some additional materials uh, probably in class or later that will cover some of these things a little bit more. So here's a summary of all the scheduling methods that we've looked at so far. Um, it gives you kind of an overview and a comparison. So we've got what kind of decision mode is it? Notice most of them are preemptive because that's what most operating systems ultimately uh, we'd like to have a preemptive system so that higher priority tasks or ones that need to hurry up and finish can interrupt something that's ongoing if necessary. But there are some in there that are non-preemptive as well. We have the priority function. In some cases there's not one, but in many cases there is. Notice also that some of the algorithms have both a preemptive and a non-preemptive mode, like MLF and ML. Um, so they have different uh, statistics, if you will. Um, so we have the priority function shown, uh, MLF being certainly the most mathematically complex one. Um, and then we have the arbitration rule. So if two things, two processes sort of end up at the same priority, if you will, um, how do we decide between them? In most cases, it's uh, random or it could be chronological, in other words, age in the system, if you will. Um, and then a few are things like cyclic, like some of the ones we're talking about now. And then there's a list of all the variables and what they mean in terms of uh, being able to do the computations for the priority function. So that's a handy table. Um, 
that you might want to keep keep around, especially as you're working on your uh, homework and project assignment, that we uh, find that useful. So, I'm not sure how that box got in the way, but we'll move it out of the way. So, um, the three listed here, FIFO, SJF, and SRT, those have been developed primarily for batch operating systems. And we've talked about batch systems before where there's no user interaction. We load up a whole bunch of jobs, say the first thing in the morning, and then based on the uh, priority function, they execute um, in an optimal way to, to complete. So a lot of mainframe type systems and things uh, at least have modes they operate in where they're doing batch type processing. Usually this involves things where we're maybe moving a lot of data around, doing computations on data, and then storing it back into a database or something like that. So things, uh, for example, you know, banks use a lot of batch systems where they take all the transactions for the day and update the master copy of, of all your bank account information and stuff like that. So if we know what the total service time is, the SJF and SRT are better than FIFO since they're going to reduce the average turnaround time, but we don't always know what the total service time is. Um, for some applications, we may be able to determine that because it's, it's very fixed. Others, especially if we have to interact with users at all, um, that's going to introduce a, a randomness to those uh, total service times. Um, but if we know it, then we can use either SJF or SRT and know we'll get a better average turnaround time, um, which is one of the things we use to compare these different scheduling algorithms. Average turnaround time is usually shortest using SJF uh, rather than SRT. Um, turnaround is computed as the sum of the wait times and the total service time of all processes divided by the number of processes. So, and we've computed that before, so that just puts into words what, what we mean mean by term or average turnaround time and how we compute it. So in time sharing systems, or those ones that have user interaction a lot, we want to minimize response time. So that's another measure that we want to use. Let me move this block again. Um, so RR and MLF are the ones that we would use to accomplish that. Uh, Round robin divides the CPU according to the time quantum, Q, which we can adjust to, to optimize. Uh, as Q gets larger, as it approaches infinity, processes are never preemptive, and it basically becomes the FIFO. So a lot of these are similar as we adjust um, certain parameters. So if basically I make your, give you, you know, approaching infinity CPU time, so the quantum is, is you get this whole slice of the pie, if you will. Um, then the process is never preempted and it devolves into a FIFO. In other words, things operate in the order they arrived. Um, as, as the um, quantum approaches zero, the overhead for context switching overtakes all the CPU time, and so we don't get any work done. So we have to realize those two boundaries when we're determining what the quantum size is going to be. Um, so most of these dynamic type schemes are designed to take processes that are I.O. bound, in other words, they're, they're busy doing disk activity or perhaps even interacting with the user, moving them to the top of the priority queue and CPU bound processes drop to lower levels. Um, because the idea here is we're, we're trying to you know, maximize uh, interactivity or minimize response time, the amount of time it takes for, for once you, as a user, for example, type in something or select something the amount of time it takes for a response to be seen. We've talked about that idea before about how after about you know, four or five seconds people get very antsy if something hasn't happened. So, um, and four or five seconds in CPU time is, a, is a, an eternity almost. So um, we probably should be able to accomplish a lot of that amount of time. Uh, MLF does this by always placing new processes and newly awakened processes into the highest priority queue. So as soon as you come back from, for example, doing disk IO, you go into the highest priority queue. That's certainly one way to accomplish this. Um, this assignment, which we call the schedule, we've been calling the schedule for quite a time now, is said to be feasible as long as we satisfy all the deadlines. And it's optimal if it always produces a feasible schedule if one exists. So here's some, some important sort of theorems for you that kind of kind of hidden away here, although they are in, in pretty colors. Um, so we, we call uh, assignment a process a schedule 
and it's feasible if we can man manage to satisfy all the deadlines, whether it be a real-time system or not, and it's optimal if it always produces a feasible schedule. And here's one last um, example for these last two real-time functions of how they compare against each other. So rate monotonic, while being simpler, um, it's simpler than EDF, and it has uh, predictability for the highest priority tasks. We can determine when they're going to be completed. Um, EDF ensures full processor utilization, so whereas Rate monotonic, we may have periods where we're not doing anything um, because of the way we scheduled. Um, we can, however, with EDF, enter into overload conditions where we would get misbehavior, whereas the decision-making function that we use for rate monotonic says that we can't get over 0.78 utilization. So uh, that way we guarantee that we shouldn't have any misbehaviors because we still have excess CPU time that we're not trying to use. We can define the overall CPU utilization then by uh, summing up all the times, the, the, the ratios of, of the times versus the uh, periodicity. So in this case, n is the number of processes, t sub i is the service time, and d sub i is the period length. If we sum up all those, uh, it should approach 1. If it is 1, then the CPU is completely saturated. If it's less than or equal to 1, it's feasible to schedule it with EDF. It's less than 0.7, approximately 0.78, I think was the number we had before, uh, then it may work with uh, rate monotonic. Uh, so based on those criteria, EDF is better than RM as a choice because I can use more of the more of the process time, processor time, and uh, still accomplish uh, and at the same time accomplish as much work as possible. Uh, so take a look at these and take a look at the discussions in your textbook as well. And if there are any questions, you can bring those up at the next class period. Um, otherwise, we'll could be going back to, again, talking about We have a couple other mechanisms. We'll be going back to talking about um, synchronization tools uh, at a little higher level. Thanks, and I'll see you next class period.